Hello and welcome to Femtech Live Lounge, a monthly discussion that celebrates the intersection of technology and the AI industry. This series is presented by Virtual Patent Gateway. Today's interviewer is Haley Day, a licensed attorney and senior director at Moray Global, who has collaborated with law firms and corporate legal departments to drive digital transformation initiatives, service their business as a strategic partner, and eliminate operational inefficiencies for over a decade. Haley's expertise lies in guiding clients through change management processes, strategic transformations, and the implementation of technology solutions that align with their business objectives. Joining Haley is Amy Mushawar, Chair of the Data Privacy and Cybersecurity Practice at Lowenstein Sandler. And with that, I'll pass things over to Haley. Thank you, Caitlin. And thank you all for having us today. I'm very excited to introduce my colleague, Amy Mushawar. Amy has over 20 years of experience in the technology space, advising clients nationwide on issues concern, concerning data security, cyber risk, privacy, emerging technologies. Amy provides counsel on proactive data security practices, data breach, incident response, and regulatory compliance. And Amy works with state, federal, local government agencies, and of course, tech and other clients as well. Amy, did you want to add anything else to your intro today? Well, nothing other than what we're going to discuss about in, in terms of incident response, it's from being a day-to-day -day incident responder. So there's never a day when I don't have several incidents on my desk, in my mind, and unfortunately, sometimes in the headlines. Yeah, absolutely. Well, as we kick off our conversation today, we do have our housekeeping of disclaimers that our views and opinions shared on today's Femtech Live Lounge are those of our own. Um, they are not those of our employer and they should not be taken as legal advice. Absolutely. All right. Well, I'm excited for us to get down to this conversation, Amy, because as you know, we all hear the term breach frequently in our life. Um, when Amy and I were prepping for our conversation today, we talked about just defining what is a breach. And the first thing that came to my mind was just how frequently we hear that terminology socially. Right. We think of breaches when we think of contractual obligations, warranties, environmental concerns with all of the local things going on with the hurricanes. We think of um, if you're like me and you've had children and maybe you had a very stubborn second child that was breach. <laughs> so uh, breach. My first one mind. was. <laughs> it's all one. Um, so breach is often that word that no matter what we, what circumstances we hear it in, we wince a little bit. Um, and the one topic that Amy and I will be focused on today is that of data breaches within cybersecurity. So, um, data breaches can take place at any time and it, they can be in multiple different formats. Uh, this word isn't foreign to us in business by any means. As I said, it comes up and means many different things. But there are generally, when it comes to cybersecurity, both a data or a security breach. Within data breaches, those things are generally hacking, phishing, insider threats, ransomware, or even physical breaches where you've lost your laptop, an employee's lost a laptop, there was a theft of a laptop or a mobile device. So the data, having access to the data from anybody not granted access can in and of itself form a breach. Security breaches are also going to be unauthorized access, malware infiltration, Denial of service attacks, where we have a disruption access to services, um, a system's just pinging constantly, overwhelming the system, and then also misuse of privileges. So someone who has authorization 
to a certain file, but maybe they go in and download it for purposes of, you know, not what their authorizations or permissions are granting them. Um, Amy, I know we were also going to talk today about the legal definition. Did you want to continue with that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and we will be getting into a way um, how AI impacts breach. But to talk about the legal definition, most of us just think of a breach in terms of the exfiltration, access, deletion, alteration of personally identifiable information. So it's like those breach notices that you receive in the mail when your data is compromised. Um, that definition is now broader and does include things like the unavailability of data, especially for those of you in healthcare. And what I am always talking to clients about is a breach is not only one of personally identifiable information. Um, in a corporation, especially, you could have a breach of important intellectual property and other trade secrets um, that you want to make sure that you are keeping private. But what's most important within the definition and what we do with the definition is in the past five years, once we find a breach, the stepping point for notification and deadlines thereof are stepped up. You're often making decisions within 24, 48, 72 hours. So there's a lot to do in a small window of time. So as we think about breach and AI and merging those two topics together, AI can be very helpful and functional, especially in Haley's area of expertise, electronic discovery and consulting, because we often need to know as much as we possibly can about data to make quick decisions in a very short time frame. So we'll talk a little bit about AI as a benefit and a little bit about how unfortunately the actors are using AI to make our lives a little harder and then round that out with a little bit of what you can do with AI regarding defense and depth security technologies using AI. Back to you, Haley. <laughs> That's wonderful. And thank you for hitting on kind of the precursor for our conversations about AI. Artificial intelligence is something that I think we're all very passionate about now. I mean, everybody's eager to learn and at least get um, some, some intel on where they should be taking AI for their organization or their day-to-day -day life. Um, at Murray, we do a lot of AI risk analysis. We help people with ideation use case workshops. And cybersecurity and incident planning is one where AI is frequently a discussion on both sides of the table, the good and the bad. So we will be talking about that today. And to kick us off more, I wanted to just bring up some common causes of breach. So things that might happen in day-to-day -day life that are just human error, operator error. Um, we, no matter how much we pride ourselves on being tech savvy, can easily fall victim to some of these breach opportunities. So those common causes generally start, as I mentioned, with human error phishing attacks, malware, loss of a, de a device, um, system vulnerabilities, not running the appropriate amount of uh, in-point detection and doing your, having the appropriate security measures in place, not updating your computer appropriately. Um, one big area that we always I think as, as employees and end users, we sometimes get annoyed with all of the different things we're asked to do, right? All of the different trainings, but those are so critical because it is very, very easy to fall into some of these phishing scams. That's a very common way that malware gets in and infiltrates our environments. 
And you'd be surprised, again, with the use of AI, how well people are able to misrepresent themselves, um, mask their identity, and try to gain access to your environment. Amy, if you'll take us through some of the stages of breach. So once one of those common causes has taken place, what are the things that our listeners can expect to start to kick off? Absolutely. And it's really, unfortunately, a four-step deadly waltz. <laughs> the first being, you know, you have some form of initial compromise. You, you, an attacker gets an initial foothold. Most often, that initial foothold is gained through phishing. So mm -hmm. if, if everyone here learns nothing else, um, there are automated tools to assist with phishing tests and also automated um, risk assessments for when someone is logging in and whether or not they're coming from a known IP or a risky login location. So, you know, super, super helpful to never allow that attacker to get that initial foothold and in either a system or protected login to help them move within your network. The second stage, lateral movement, is when an attacker uses that initial foothold and uses that initial foothold to find a database with PII, protected computers, or other um, you know, computing equipment with either confidential secrets or data that you would not want disclosed as a business or as an individual. Um, there are also AI tools to detect movement of information and resources across systems within your environment. And usually those are within a data loss prevention program or a DLP program. So an attacker usually doesn't get exactly what they need from that initial foot hit, foothold. They have to go somewhere. Once they go somewhere and they find either the data or the resources they would like, they usually try to exfil that data. And that means using either that initial foothold or any other system they can find with direct internet access to get your data off of your environment and onto one of their bots, one of their compromised endpoints, anywhere where they can mine information in order to ultimately ransom you with it, unfortunately, or sell it on the dark web. And then lastly, the last stage in the waltz, unfortunately, isn't the attacker stage. It's the remediation. It's once you find that those steps have occurred, and hopefully you have tools in place to help you find them a little earlier and the data expo never comes, you do have to remediate and trace the attacker's actions and make sure that you've closed all of the, the holes in which either that attacker has opened or the vulnerabilities they walked through. So um, with this in mind, I, I think it'd be great, Haley, for us to talk about how AI itself lends functionality to cyber and lends us functionality to detection of those stages. Absolutely. Um, a big area that we see with AI is in response and remediation. So we can use AI to do threat detection Artificial intelligence is very good at looking for patterns. So any type of unusual patterns, traffic to your site or your areas, unusual behaviors, user activities, excessive downloads, renaming conventions, all of those things are a great area to be always scanning your environment and looking for that type of threat detection. Let me um, delve a little bit further, kind of from the perimeter and going out. Um, most of the time, for, for those of you within a network, you want to, before you introduce your IP space or, you know, your communication to the outside world, you usually want to have a proxy like Akamai, Cloudflare. Mm -hmm. um, those proxies have AI attached to them so they can detect unusual traffic pattern spikes, credential attempts, and multiple credential attempts at, at your servers. 
Um, or just a flood of traffic where someone's trying to DDoS or just denial of service or distributed denial of service to shut down your systems. Going from the perimeter and hiding your IPs with a tool that can help buffer you from the outside world using AI is a really, really important tool in your arsenal to keep your enterprise up and to help from getting an initial foothold. Moving into your environment, um, in order to access your environment, you're either going to need a VPN or you know, some sort of access landing pad or VPN or VDI. Um, before logging into one of those access devices at your perimeter, there are um, identity management and identity traffic management tools that you can use with AI to detect whether or not you're coming from a risky IP and whether or not to force additional multi-factor authentication. Um, also, making sure um, with AI-based tools, if you have um, threat detection and the ability to, to determine whether or not someone is coming through from a risky IP and they forced MFA, do you also have the ability, once they get onto your enterprise, if they successfully do, to monitor their behavior? But we want proxies, we want some risk-based authentication once someone's coming in, and then once they're into your environment and have an endpoint within your environment, please, oh, please, oh, please, have endpoint detection and response. Mm. It has done a wonderful job with tools like CrowdStrike's Falcon, Palo Alto, and Sentinel-1, um, where it can detect and real-time stop threat actor activity. Where my clients have, of course, EDR tools can always be end run, but where my clients have endpoint tools on their systems, they tend to have smaller breaches and less data exfil because things like Sentinel-1 can see when a system is being encrypted, stop it, and then stop the crawl of that system looking for the next adjacent system in order to encrypt it. So, yeah, AI, that's, that's a great point, Amy, because the EDR tools really do, for lack of a better term, stop the bleeding. They have that power. So that is such a critical point. Mm -hmm. well, absolutely. And in my world of trying to prevent the breach, you know, we have a lot of tools that are enabling us to do a better job of breach prevention. But Haley, once you have your data exfiled, you know, we are also in the circumstance of having sometimes to analyze terabytes of data that come out the door um, yeah. and have to report on it. And I know that that kind of hit, hits in the doorstop of your world where e-discovery tools have by far improved with AI and, and made our job not easier because breach will never be easy but at least somewhat more digestible or giving us more actionable intelligence about the data as we're going through. Absolutely. The, the improvements in the e-discovery space with AI, um, the technology there and how your, not only your breach council, but internally your own processes and the e-discovery solutions you use as well as any partners you have in that space, there's a lot of methodologies there and how those individuals and including your organization approach the breach is critical for time is money once you've gotten that, once that act has occurred and the data has to start being reviewed. So AI is very powerful from a forensics analysis standpoint, because if we use the technology appropriately, we can dial in on where personal information has been exposed, where data has been downloaded, the number of impacted individuals, the number of impacted environments, down scaling your data so that we have an idea of just how many people 
need to be notified or what the next step is, what the actual ramifications are, is critical because we don't want you or any any person in a scenario where they have experienced a breach to automatically feel it's something we're going to tell the world about. There's a very special process that needs to take place in the guidance. So using the e-discovery tools that have that AI technology and have that power behind them helps you so much really refine that actual exposed information data set. Yeah. And to be a bit more pinpointed, guys, um, e-discovery often is the most expensive piece Mm -hmm. of your breach other than the lawsuits and the credit monitoring. Um, E-discovery can cost millions of dollars, especially if you have millions of individual records exposed. So what e-discovery does not do, it will not tell you in 24, 48, or 72 hours how many people you have, exactly how many data points you have, um, and be able to give you the universe to make you know, a lot of the quick decisions that you have to make. Yeah. What it will enable you to do is that long tail period from the time in which you, you discover that a security anomaly occurred until the time that you truly know you have a breach because you have a release of personally identifiable information. E-discovery has dramatically shortened that window from months, and often it can be six, seven, eight months if you have terabytes of data that is released, you know, to a few weeks. And depending on the data repository, it can be a little more, especially if you have an unstructured data repository and not a database that was released. Mm -hmm. But shortening that window means if you have, if you're in a jurisdiction where you have to notify very early and your customers know, but you don't know anything that you can tell them yet regarding the PII, it shortens that window where your customers are calling you panicked. And I think that matters more than money because your customers are everything to your business. Um, But even though we are focusing on AI in incident prevention and incident response, I think as we close, it might be helpful just to talk a little bit about things you cannot automate with AI, but they're not going away. And they're still very important. And just we augment the way that we look at them because of AI. Um, you know, and Haley, if, I'm, if I may, just to to, to, um, to chat a bit about, um, first of all, getting your breach counsel involved very early to initiate privilege as early as you possibly can. That's not an automated function of of AI that's gonna be picking up the phone when you need to. Mm -hmm. It can be a function though of workflow. There are tools like Savingus and other incident response software that you can make sure that within your breach checklist, you have an appropriate protocol for when to call in internal and external counsel. Um, Very, very important, can be workflowed, Make sure you trigger privilege as early as you can, because unfortunately, when there are breaches of PII, now there are indeed lawsuits in most cases. I used to just be able to say it was a fraction of the cases because of the CCPA, the California um, Privacy and Data Breach Statute, mm-hmm. as well as other class action um, driving statutes like the Fair Credit Reporting Act and others. We have a lot of lawsuits in the space, privilege and trying to protect those investigative communication thoughts and opinions is really, really, really important. Um, Because we have stepped up breach notice, you can't AI the notification process. That's still going to be a human-based process of figuring out when did I actually discover this, as opposed to when I just received an alert. The day that the anomaly came in is not a discovery. But because you have that stepped up process, the human element of discovery is not going away, but the AI components of over our main repositories, do we know what's there? Have we data mapped our enterprise? Those good components can be assisted with AI-based technology 
And doing your homework in that regard can make people like me who step in, people like Haley who step in much more effective. And we can look out for you, especially Mm -hmm. once we have that discovery pathway. If we have a discovery pathway into a database that is mapped, we know what's at issue. We know what's at risk. If you haven't done that homework with AI and other tools, you're in worse shape than you would have been had that data been mapped. And often that second breach where you don't know what you've compromised is a much more expensive breach. And then if I said anything today, please know your your contact data for both your clients and your individuals. Once you know, you discover a breach, you know what's impacted, and you're down to the point where you have to legally notify if you're a business-to-business company, your individual clients, and if you're a consumer-facing custom uh, company, your consumers, almost every enterprise you walk into has very difficult customer data. And it often takes a considerable amount of time to call through that contact information in order to be able to notify people. That, that takes time out of your processes. For those of you who have consumers, there are tools available that you, know, you can be calling your databases, making sure you have actionable addresses. Mm-hmm. Um, that's good for business. It's good for data breach response. For your clients, constantly getting updated contact information, making sure that you know their data breach procedures when the time of right, time is right. It's good for business. It's good for data breach response. So we want you to think about AI in terms of how to make breaches better, but we also want you to think about the things that don't require AI because they're always going to be needed if someone like me or Haley have to step in and help you notify a breach. Um, I think one way for us to conclude too is to talk a little bit about AI as a bad actor with the two minutes we have left. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Would it be helpful to to chat about a little bit about a war story to close guys? I love a good war story. Okay. Well, um, most of our cases nowadays are ransomware cases and, um, where a threat actor gets in, tries to encrypt the environment, sometimes fails because your VDR actually encrypts the environment and has data exfiltrated ahead of time. So the encryption or that attempted encryption is the very last thing they do. Um, those actors used to be known actors where they would send you a pastebin file and show you, you know, kind of the, their credibility and, and how they have impacted other businesses. They don't do that now. Too many of them have gotten caught or have had their operations stilted um, by the FBI and other law enforcement actors. Now, unfortunately, they are using AI to hide themselves. Um, We used to be able to identify attackers by the syntax of their communications, by their ransom letters, by um, the actual tools that they're deploying to encrypt your environment or an attempted encryptment or a credential stealer. Um, AI is helping attackers modify the tools that they're using. It's helping them write distinctive ransom notes. And it's also helping them when they're on ransom boards, communicating with our negotiators, um, use a different syntax in order to communicate back. And admittedly, I think one of the scariest things is it's also enabled them to use botnets to go out to client lists. And it's also, you know, when you have individuals um, where a threat actor has already targeted for identity theft, sometimes you will have individuals being doxxed so the threat actor can hide that they are filing taxes on your behalf or or stealing um, money out of your accounts or actually hiding that identity theft by distracting you as a human being. So we have a lot of promise with AI and a lot of things that we can do, but attackers are also using AI to make our job that much harder. So, you know, they automate automate their path forward as well. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. And as we think about this and give ourselves a close, um, it's very important for companies to use what you can to automate detection and response because there's always going to be more to do on the back end because attackers are continually innovating. Absolutely. Well said, Amy. There's a lot of proactive things that you can do. If you don't know where to start, feel free to call Amy or me. We're happy to talk with you about that. The proactive measures are a valuable investment of your time. We cannot stress that enough. Um, and proactive measures are not one step or one size fits all. They will be unique to your organization needs. They will be unique to your clients and customers. And they are ongoing. This is an area that does not um, stand it up and walk away. We have to continually test our incident response plans. But the good news is, is that you have a lot of tools that you can um, reach out to and assist you in this process and you're not alone. So that investment will never be one made in vain. And we are so excited that we got this chance to talk with you all. We'd love to talk more. This is obviously a topic that we're both very passionate about. Amy has so much, so much knowledge on this and she really has seen it all. So I do hope that if you all have any questions, you know, you can reach out to us about anything. And thank you, Haley. This has been a really fun conversation. Lovely. And likewise, a good e-discovery team is a very hard thing to find. Yeah. So once you find one like Haley's team that can help you get up and try to understand and make your data actionable, it's extremely helpful in the incident response process. I couldn't agree more, Amy. Thank you. Thank you for all your expertise. And Caitlin, thank you for having us.